thank you thanks all for your uh, presence here uh, i'm thomas juno i worked at, at and working at the university de lorraine uh, in france uh, where i'm um, research data deputy administrator i'm also a member of the research data Gouv uh, teams which works on the national repository uh, which damien will tell you more about um Mac, if you want to go ahead as the co-organizer. Yes, thank you. So uh my name is Maria Lisa uh Kusnemi, but uh, every, everybody calls me Mac, and I'm co-chair of the uh Libre Working Group research on research data management. And uh, mm, I'm from University of Helsinki or Helsinki University Library, I worked as a, a science information specialist uh, uh, developing research data management services, services at the university and national level. And then Damien. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so hello everybody. First of all, I'm very pleased you gave me the opportunity to come and present my work here for you at the Labour. Um, so I am Damien Sens. I, I work for INRAE on a project called Research Data Gouv, which is, uh, I will talk about the data repository alone and you will see about the rest of it. And I'm here today to present you how we organize the data curation on this repository and it's my function to uh, give life to this network of curators. So I will uh, show you how we do it at Research Data Gouv, if it's fine for you. We invited you. <laughs> okay, um, I will go first because I have uh, tasked my myself with uh, trying to define uh, what is indeed uh, data curation. And uh, I must admit that I was a little too uh, maybe uh, a little too ambitious because uh, it might seem simple in the era of repositories, but uh, you will see that uh, this uh, short presentation uh, introduction, introduction have a, has a lot of question marks and it's not a coincidence. Uh, data curation first. Uh, curation, as you know, comes from the world of libraries and museum, and it covers selection, collection, maintenance, and preservation of books and artifacts. When extended to dig digital curation, uh, you might say that it's a selection, content, collection, maintenance, preservation, and archiving of digital assets. For example, I don't know, uh, in France, we have a national library who works uh, a lot on uh, video games and uh, digital heritage from the 80s and 90s. That's an example. And then you have data curation, which is slightly different because you find it in a whole set of contexts from uh, enterprise uh, uh, environments to uh, public environments. And usually it's, uh, I took it from Wikipedia, it's the organization and integration of data collected from various sources. So it involves annotation. And one main point is that uh, the value of the data should be maintained over time for reuse and preservation while remaining available. Uh, whoa, it's a lot. So uh, when applied to uh, research data, it's uh, a little problematic because, uh, well, we have uh, that uh, 2003 definition from a paper uh, which you may know from data deluge to data curation. Uh, I put the link here. Uh, and uh, this uh, definition, which I will read, the activity of managing and promoting the use of data from its point of creation to ensure it is fit for contemporary purpose and available for discovery and reuse. For dynamic data sets, interesting, this may mean continuous enrichment or updating to keep it fit for purpose. 
Higher levels of curation will also involve maintaining links with annotation of other published materials. You will find a lot of concerns that are uh, uh, of uh, importance in, uh, for example, repositories. And uh, interestingly, uh, this is the de real uh, definition that is included uh, in uh, the CTS, Quarter Steel Glossary. As you may know, Quarter Steel is the, the main uh, um, certification uh, organi organization uh, and uh, the, the main yeah, certification for uh, repositories uh, right now internationally. So um, it's a 20 year old definition, which is still in a contemporary document. And you may also uh, know uh, the Digital Curation Center. Um, um, which calls itself digital curation and uh, where uh, curation uh, covers actually uh, almost the whole data life, life cycle or uh, more adequately say, said it's uh, it in, works hand in hand with uh, preservation in a kind of virtual circle and uh, it's implies that uh, research data curation support and uh, maybe research data management support were, would be synonymous. Uh, well, or is the former included in the latter? I don't know. Uh, for me, I'll assume it is the case. Because if so, what RDM support exactly services would deserve the curation label? I just took a snapshot from the website of the University of California, San Diego, just to say that the RDM support calls itself also research data curation uh, program. So um, if there's something specific about curation, why are we here? Because the, we are from a liberal group, uh, as you may uh, remember, which calls itself RDM. So what is curation uh, compared with uh, RDM? So in the model we just saw, uh, curation works hand in hand with preservation and the curation services make data ready for preservation while including notion of scientific evaluation. So would the perfect curation cocktail then involve the fair requirements, which you all know, with a dash of scientific appraisal, a yummy cocktail. But uh, I make the hypothesis that uh, while still valid in 2023, this old, uh, with big uh, big quotes definition uh, seems to have shifted uh, as multidisciplinary or institutional repositories emerged because as you may remember uh, 20 years ago there were a, li a really a small number of them and they were really specialized and now you have uh, databases you have Zenodo you have repositories everywhere and uh, in many cases, this restricted the meaning of curation to the validation processes regarding datasets in these repositories from the repository point of view. So what services, what skills, job for files involved? We'll try to uh, show some of them and we ask you the question. Just here to uh, remind you of the repository point of view as expressed again in quarter seal with the four levels of curation that are uh, defined as uh, you may see here uh, from no curation at all to uh, data level curation uh, interestingly you don't have scientific appraisal here but you have a really high level from the the shallowest to the deepest uh, of um, of curation So to illustrate this, uh, we'll present first uh, the French uh, example of Recherche Data Gouv and the organization of uh, the curation uh, of data curation as understood in uh, data set curation in a somewhat basic but national level and how it translates itself in the participating institution, mine. And uh, second, at the University of Helsinki, a more complete, maybe, uh, system, but uh, uh, which shows how to organize creation at an, an, the institutional level, but while ensuring the conditions of participation to a national preservation archive, and Mac will tell you all about this. And Damien, 
the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Thomas. So let me share my screen as well. Up. Up. Okay, are we good? So once again, let me tell you, I am very pleased that I have been invited to present to you how we organize the curation on Research Data Gov. This is um, quite kind of a young repository because it has been open since uh, last July, so it's less than a year. And uh, it has the particularity to be uh, national and federative. So you will see that uh, we have a lot of partners, but we don't have direct hierarchy with them. You know, we are all partners. So first I would like to present you my plan. So it's in five subsections, and as you can see, it's very simple. It's A, B, C, D, E. So about Research Data Gov, then what are the best practices? Then I will go to what is the creation we do in itself. Then I will explain to you how do we uh, disseminate the instructions to apply this creation everywhere. And finally, I will give back the flow to Thomas, so he will present his example for his institution. So about Research Data Gov, let me have two words about it. So we want to think that Research Data Gov is some kind of an ecosystem with several modules. And uh, so there is not just the repository, actually. There are also some modules which, which are here to accompany, to support the, res the research and the researchers in doing data production, data treatment, and then obviously that are re depositing and uh, archiving stuff like that. So among those four supporting modules, we would have some kind of generalist data librarians and some kind of modules who are more spe um, disciplinary specialists. So we will have data management clusters, thematic reference centers, institutional reference centers, and resource centers. Myself, I work for one of the resource centers which provide human resources for the registry and the catalog, the repository, stuff like that. So next year, we want to, to publish the data registry, which will be a catalog of every other repository we think are worth sharing. And, but actually there is only the repository which is online and uh, myself, I do animate a part of this repository and I would like to present you my work onto it. So here is a screenshot of the landing page of the repository. So for those of you who are already familiar with this software, this repository runs on Dataverse. So Dataverse is like an open software made by Harvard, uh, University, uh, but it's totally open and there are a lot of people from across the world working uh, onto it. We have a fork in uh, Recherche Data Gov, and so every time there is a new version, we have to make it, uh, I don't know, proper with our modifications, you know. So what can I tell you? Here we have a carousel in which we will put the institutional spaces of all our partners, you see? So I work for this space here, which is the generic space for everybody which is not a partner. And then every institution will have one of his own, one of his own that they will administrate have the way they wish. We have contents and the contents are like collections, data set and files. Obviously it's like Russian dolls, you know, there are, the, there are the, the collection in which you put the data set and in the data sets you put the files. Okay, and if you want to do research inside the repository, you can either type your research or navigate through the facets. So it's like clickable metadata. But enough of this, and uh, let's talk about what are the best practices when we talk about curation, right? So we have two complementary objectives. We want to achieve to expose fair data, and uh, we want to get the CTS label. 
but to get this uh, fair data objective, we cannot do it. We cannot do everything by ourselves. And as well as the user, they cannot do everything by themselves because obviously they are not very familiar or fond to do it, right? So it's like dancing. And uh, I mean, if as a repository to make the data findable, we provide DOI and uh, the possibility to enter other IDs, search bar to make the data accessible. We uh, we make sure that the metadata are always accessible to make the data interoperable. We provide with a scheme of metadata, which is supposed to be machine readable because it's standardized. And to make sure the data are reusable, we promote open licenses because it's the law in France. And uh, on the other side, we ask the depositors, the users of the repository to please accept to complete a lot of the metadata in the list to choose a license which is in, accor in accordance with the production of the data uh, to deposit standardized files and to make the production of the data traceable so you know like everybody who intervened would be uh, properly cited in the metadata. So if we have a question, we can ask them. Concerning the core trust seal uh, certification, well, uh, we want to practice some kind of uh, bit in between B and C curation as Thomas presented you, which is we want to have an influence on the documentary quality of the data, but we don't want to get too much into the scientific curation actually because uh, we don't have the expertise for that. We are just a data librarian or some of us are specialists, but in their own field. And we are a generalist and multidisciplinary repository. So it's complicated, but we want to push the people who deposit in our repository to, to have standardized file and uh, to, to make persistent data and metadata. So hopefully we will apply to the CTS next year and uh, let's cross fingers, right? So to achieve these best practices, we have two levers, right? So we can modify the metadata and we can modify the files, okay? So concerning the metadata, we, we've found, we targeted that it is very important to correctly enter the affiliations of the people who participated to the data production. Uh, we want uh, the, identif uh, the IDs, like ORC IDs, stuff like that, of uh, the people to be correctly uh, entered. And so every time we have to verify that. Uh, we want the producers of the data, which are the people who get the administrative ownership or financial ownership of the data to be correctly entered. And we would like people to get you know, diligent in general in uh, entering softwares, uh, cross-referencing publications, cross-referencing other data sets, and especially cross-referencing the funding agency and the research project. So everything would, it, ideally this would create like clusters of information for everybody to know where to get every part of the information on a, on a project. Concerning the files, we identify that it is uh, important to target uh, the formats of the files, uh, the structure in which the files are written so that it could be correctly previewed, uh, the, comp the documentation which uh, comes with the files. And uh, we would like, when it's possible, that the tabular data to get correctly ingested so that, well, it we could explore it with, uh, because we have some kind of a data explorer on the repository, but also we could like ask to the app, to the API to find some variables in uh, the database of every file correctly ingested, stuff like that. And we think this, uh, this functionality is pretty neat 
And so we kind of try to push people to get it done, but sometimes it's easier than other times, you know. Okay, so that's over with the shop talks. Now, how we get it done, you know, what does it mean to do the curation so that these best practices were identified get done? Oh, sorry. Well, so when we get to the metadata, well, what is it? It's like a list of uh, stuff that uh, people ask to enter and sometimes they will, sometimes they will not. So first of all, we will have to check what part of the list uh, is completed and what part of the list is not completed, right? Because you know, we have metadata that follows several format, like, I don't know, Dublin code, DDI, IZTAB, stuff like that. And uh, not everybody is interested in, in every metadata, right? But to the documentary part, we identified, you know, everybody should be interested into it. So we get on the website, we check the, li the list, and uh, we see if it is uh, correctly uh, entered. So we would like people to uh, use, I don't know, reference system registries to uh, enter their affiliation, to enter their IDs, to enter their keywords. Often it is not done, you know, so we have to do it in the stead. So we have to verify that the affiliation, it corresponds to what we find on the registries. Uh, often people will loosely enter some keywords if they ever do it. I mean, it's okay. Uh, researchers are very uh, occupied and they not necessarily have the time to, uh, to, to be diligent with every uh, metadata entry. So, I mean, we are here for that, right? So we have to get the keywords into the correct uh, uh, registries and to vocab control vocabularies and uh, to find the entries that correspond. And often we will have to search for the OK ideas also of uh, the researchers to be sure that they have one and they did not enter one, stuff like that. Occasionally, we will have to cross-check on internet, obviously, and uh, when it's done, we write everything in our recommendations in an email because, I mean, it's what we should do, right? We should not modify the data set of someone without uh, telling him, okay, I would like to do that. Do, do I have your, your go to do it? And we should also modify the files, as I told you. So, what do we do with the files? We want it to be correctly previewed. So often the file, you can preview it. It's especially a thing with tabular, met, with tabular data. I mean, everybody has its way to write it, right? So often we will have to check. Then if it doesn't work, we'll have to modify it. So we download and then we cross verify what we saw on, inter what we saw on the re repository and uh, what we've seen in the files, it's possible that we have to get into it and to modify it. And if we feel that uh, the files are not very clear, then we will ask for documentation. We have a model of readme that we will recommend to the researchers. And uh, I mean, if you have, tabular statistics, you know, and uh, all the variables, they are abbreviated and there is no documentation to tell you what are the, uh, the metrics in, in the cells and uh, what those means the abbreviation uh, of the variables, then obviously you will need at least a data dictionary, right? So that's the kind of thing we do because often the description will be just something like, uh, this is the data of this article, which it's not very sufficient because well, we would like the data to be standalone. So the documentation accompanying the data to be sufficient to understand it without having to read the article, right? So this is the kind of stuff we have to write uh, in, the, in the recommendation we send and uh, we have to present it in a pedagog pedagogical way. So people will will accept to do it. 
So that's what we identified as uh, what should be done. And how could we do it? Well, myself, I work for the central team. So we are part of the resource center that uh, will give life to this repository, right? And uh, we provide a generic space in which we do the job like everybody else, but for every people who are not partners yet in the research sector. We have a portal, which is a website on which we publish user guides, actual news, stuff like that. And the partners, they have their own team and uh, they are like us, but I mean, myself, I do only this research data group, but my partners like Thomas, they have a lot of other missions. And so they want me to provide them with uh, operational stuff, turnkey solution, right? So this is why we kind of produce a toolkit that will uh, give them the opportunity to make time efficient the data curation and to understand what we would like them to do to achieve the CTS and uh, the fair data objectives that we gave ourselves. Well, the other institution we provide then work teams, feedbacks, because I mean, we need feedbacks to improve ourselves. We provide data expertise because often they do that for several years already. And obviously they are on the field. So they can, they can go to the labs, they can meet the researchers and tell them, okay, this is how you should do it. Or I don't know, do it in the stead, maybe getting into the lab uh, to present what are the different solution for them. You know, I mean, disciplinary or multidisciplinary. So what do we provide in this toolkit? Well, right now uh, we provide a curation report which is kind of a checklist of uh, every metadata we want to check and uh, the instruction of what we would like to the, the depositor to enter, to complete this entry. We provide the readme model, as I told you, because some data sets, they need a documentation, for a thorough documentation. And often people do not, know how to do it. So we made a shallow readme with like parts in which we, we said, okay, replace this part with your information. We provide open classes and uh, we have three level of open classes to deposit, to administrate and, to use, and uh, how to use the API. And so we give at least, uh, one of each every month. Uh, we have a mailing list, but uh, it's only for the administrators and the data curators. I mean, actually we are like 30 partners in uh, Recherche Data Group. So it's a list of, uh, I don't know, 80 people, 90 people. I don't know exactly right now, but uh, yes, it's pretty much a huge list, I, I think. And uh, so we, we can say to people, what are the news? When do we invite them to do something new? Stuff like that. Uh, we have interactive tutorials. They just got out and they are made with another resource center, which is called uh, Duranium. They are experts in making uh, interactive uh, tutorial and pedagogical resources in general. We share our cloud so we can exchange some documents about how to do whatever. We have a chat. so. If the mailing list is not sufficient and uh, we need to be able to chat with each other to get a quick answer on, on something, we can use the chat. And the most important, we have remote meetings. So bi-monthly, we uh, meet each other. Well, uh, we did it only two times, right? Uh, we are around 50 people coming. And it's a two hours meeting in which uh, we will be able to discuss about uh, how to do some specific part of the curation, right? 
So like last time we talked about how do we manage the support of our uh, institutional space and the time before we talked about how do we organize uh, administration and curation between people and uh, how some would like to propose scientific curation, but as they cannot do it themselves, they go to the laboratory and uh, they find scientific curators there to get in their team. And I think that's exactly what Thomas is going to tell you about because now I'm done. Okay, thank you, Damien. Um, are you hearing me? Yes, I guess so. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, just to, just to, to, to make a focus on the case of the, uh, the Université de Lorraine. So uh, it's a rather large university because it was uh, created uh, at the occasion of a merger in uh, 2012. And uh, we have uh, actually uh, implemented an institutional repository, which is called Dorel, and which is merging uh, at the end of this year, normally, into research data groups. That is to say that the, the, the data sets will uh, uh, migrate, at least their metadata, uh, into the national repository. And the next slide, please. Yes. So how is it organized? We have a core team of four people, including me, um, who validate and uh, check and uh, uh, try to make sure that the data sets that are deposited are uh, according to the rules that we have uh, set and we, that we have uh, actually actualized and we, that we uh, still actualize uh, currently uh, to uh, to match uh, those of uh, Recherche Data Gov because uh, behind uh, this uh, uh, these uh, these checks these uh, these verifications there's uh, also as uh, Damien told you that's the 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 goal of uh, the CTS certification so uh, for which every member institution will have will hold a kind of responsibility. And then we have a network of volunteer curators in research labs. Um, they're not really busy right now. Uh, I think it will change because in France, uh, the, the obligation to, not the obligation, but the strong incitation to deposit the, the data at the end of, the pro of a project will soon uh, raise as uh, the, the projects that have uh, committed to do uh, DNP uh, will come to an end. The obligation to have a DMP for the nationally uh, funded project uh, was in 2019. So I think that this uh, will uh, cause uh, many data to be deposited in uh, Recherche de Tagouv. And so this network of volunteer curators in research labs are people who are uh, close to researchers, cl cl close to the disciplines. And we think it's an asset to have uh, people who actually know uh, what the data sets are about because uh, we don't always <laughs> uh, know it uh, ourselves. And uh, this mm -hmm. network will uh, be uh, also active in uh, the national repository. Thanks. Okay, Max, I think the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. I hope Bye. we didn't take too much time. No, certainly not. And I'll, I try to talk. I need to share my, share my screen. Just a minute. So I'm going to tell you something about the data curation at the University of Helsinki, uh, I'm focusing on curation processes and skills needed. Mm. But uh, first I will talk, uh, tell you something as a background of the university and then go to the processes and then at the last, I will talk 
a little bit about skills. About the university, we have uh, about 30,000 uh, students, 8,000 employees, and 10,000 publications a year. So it's the uh, biggest university of Finland. Uh, we have a, a service for researchers called data support, but it's not actually a unit. Uh, it is a network of experts. And they, uh, behind this uh, help desk called data support or services uh, called data support, there is uh, several units like central archives, data security, IT services, legal affairs, about the legal affairs is both uh, GDPR and agreements. Then a library, uh, we have a data management team at the library and then research affairs is coordinating the data policy uh, level stuff and so on. Uh, so uh, we, for researchers, we talk about data support which is uh, offering several services. Uh, around research data management. Mm, we have, uh, or we almost have two data, curated data archives at the University of Helsinki. The first one is the national uh, data archive for long-term preservation. Uh, and it can be only used if data is created uh, at the university level in our case. Uh, so organizations uh, using national data archives are responsible of uh, creating data. And uh, on this uh, archive, you can Deposit data only if it's seen as a nationally valuable data set. Uh, uh, even this is a national data archive um, managed by, by CSC, uh, National IT for Science, Center for IT Center for Science. Uh, still, that uh, data rights remains with the organization depositing data, which means that we are, we are truly uh, responsible of the data we uh, deposit there. So we choose which one, uh, which data sets we will uh, preserve and for how long or it, uh, and we are responsible of the content. Then we will have an institutional data archive and the development is in process uh, and it will be ready for piloting this autumn. And this uh, data archive is for storing data for five to 15 years. Uh, and our curation process there concentrates to ensure that given given digital research outputs uh, that cannot be stored or preserved elsewhere, such as uh, in domain-specific data archives. So this is a supplementary archive for those who don't have the uh, domain-specific data archives to use. Uh, and uh, in curation process, we need to ensure that data rights are okay and data protection things has been taken uh, in to consider and we will uh, check that there is uh, sufficient documentation and metadata. Uh, we concentrate to discovery metadata, uh, but we will uh, give guidance also for high level metadata. But we we are not going to check file file level metadata for these data sets. And then about the curation process we have. Uh, 
fast uh, reset uh, contacts uh, that support so, uh, through our email or with the e, e form we have. Uh, and after that, we arrange the uh, first two meeting with them. Uh, and the data protection and GDPR and uh, agreements about data rights are the main topics at the first meeting we have in Zoom mainly. Uh, and the, these, with these, we uh, mm, we have uh, we spend a lot of time mostly. This, this is these are not so so easy to mm, mm, to handle in most cases. After that, uh, researchers introduces the documentation uh, for us and uh, we coach researchers uh, to about data documentation and check uh, file formats which are proper for preservation. Then researcher introduces the data collection to the scientific board of the faculty. We have 13 faculties and each of them have scientific boards and they, they will evaluate the scientific value of data. We give for the scientific board an, uh, an report on, the, on data uh, documentation because it, it, it is important to, for scientific board to know what, uh, is if, it, if the data is actually reusable and easy to understand and how much work it will take to make data such that it's uh, fair enough for preservation. But we, uh, scientific board is the one uh, deciding the scientific value of data, if it's nationally valuable or not. And after that, uh, metadata is completed and we will coach with that. Uh, and then we transfer data to the uh, data archive. In that case, uh, point, we will add discovery metadata uh, like orchids and such, which Damien was mentioning. And uh, then we need to validate and data, uh, create checksums and so on, and other uh, technical stuff. Uh, I told you more detail about some points of the, of the curation process. Uh, data rights and GDPR, it's, it's not so simple case because uh, one current collection of data has often created in several projects uh, and uh, that might involve mul multiple uh, research partners, research agreements, in best case written agreements, but most likely they are oral or just implied because it's not so common that uh, researchers actually uh, have all, all agreements needed. Uh, they, they, are not used to write those down. And also, also data can come from uh, several sources, like from other organization, different projects and so on. So you need to know the, um, where the data originally came from uh, and what is the part that uh, researchers from our university has has uh, created. And uh, so it is very challenging to manage rights after data collection. It should be done before it's collected. And, uh, but uh, unfortunately it hasn't done in written format uh, in many cases. So, so we need to, need to uh, do it afterwards. 
And of course, we try to change this so that uh, when we evaluate DMP data management plans and uh, give training on data management planning, we need we, we try to stress out that uh, agreement needs to be, needs to be done before data collection. Uh, and then on GDPR versus reality, it creates complex challenges. Uh, researchers uh, might know GDPR in theory, but how, how to actually, uh, how it uh, combines to a particular case, it's not, not so easy to say. Uh, it's quite often that researchers do doesn't uh, identify the um, Undirect identifiers. Uh, they don't. They can say that this is uh, anonymous data set, even it's not, and so on. So it's very difficult uh, for us who need to be certain that there is no undirect identifiers in a large data set. And of course, the new indirect identifiers might emerge over time when more and more registered are openly available and searchable, it's easier to uh, comply, combine, combine uh, information from, from these registers. And then it might be happen that over time, you, you can identify the participants of the research project, even you have removed the direct identifiers uh, when you uh, deposited the data to a data object. So the, these are, um, we spend uh, a lot of time with these questions. And these uh, data rights and GDPR are actually the main reason why we reject the data. We can't uh, take the data if there, there is uh, not clear who is the owner. And what uh, and if uh, GDPR documentation is not clear clear enough. And then about the coaching of data documentation, uh, we use a table of contents of documentation guide. We have we send it uh, uh, we will send it uh, for the research. Researchers before the Zoom meeting we have, and uh, then we go through uh, the main main uh, aspects of data documentation, like file naming, folder structure. Uh, is there uh, some kind of standard metadata standard used, uh, and so on. Uh, and of course, yeah, readme files, data, dictionaries, code books, and so on. Um, in my, my more, most cases, uh, these all are not the names of these kind of things are not, or terminology is not, uh, we don't have a common terminology with researchers, but with this guide, we can create uh, basic knowledge of uh, documentation and common language. So it's easier to discuss uh, with researchers when we have this guide. And uh, we actually ask researchers to show their data. So they will open examples of all kinds of files and present them to us and try to explain to get our, uh, us to understand what, what is in the file. So we try to understand and, and ask questions and uh, we ask particularly about documentation of methods concerning data collection and analysis and variables used. Uh, during this discussion, researchers uh, learn what is required on data documentation. And the, uh, and the goal is that they can decide for themselves whether the documentation is good enough to describe the data packets as a self-explanatory entity. Uh, and we assume that future user is a researcher in the same research field. So we are not uh, researchers of 
all research fields. We have our own research background, but uh, we don't need to understand everything, but we need to make uh, sure that researchers understand what is self-explanatory entity and they can decide themselves if, if the uh, documentation is good enough. And for this coaching, it will take uh, uh, two to four meetings, it's one hour, uh, but sometimes more. Uh, so we, we have like uh, one or two meetings around uh, GDPR and agreements and two to four meetings with documentation coaching. And uh, the evaluation of scientific value, uh, like I said, each faculty has a research board and the research board members should be able to evaluate scientific value of the, day, of the data of their own research field or nearby research field. Uh, and uh, there is a coordinator of the board. Uh, she or he comes from the research service at the university. And we communicate first with the coordinators to get them to understand the need of evaluation. We have 13, 13 research boards or scientific boards. And uh, of course, um, uh, coordinators change and board change. And we need to all the time educate them uh, what is the task, uh, why we need uh, um, this kind of evaluation. So, we help coordinators to explain to the board members why this is needed, what, what, what is expected from them. Uh, sometimes coordinators uh, do the work. Uh, sometimes they ask us to the board meeting to explain this and uh, uh, it varies a lot. But uh, often we get to the uh, board meeting and discussion with research boards is very fruitful and we learn how they generally see the value of data resources and the research field, and it's very solid. There are research fields who see uh, the value of data as a main resource of the uh, faculty. And then there are uh, faculties who don't really um, get the concept yet. <laughs> they, 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 they don't, they like see the publications are important, but that are not so much. But, uh, but they, it's very uh, good to know what, what is the, how they see it so that you can adjust your marketing uh, speak and everything uh, uh, accordingly, uh, so that you know where, where put your effort. You don't need to, do so much uh, work with those who already understand the value of data. Uh, yeah. And then about the skills needed, uh, after we have these services now for four years or something, uh, I think that uh, you need courage, you need to uh, discuss with researchers, uh, so you need communication skills, uh, a knowledge of research fields, knowledge of research practices, methods and so on, uh, knowledge of data management and services related, knowledge of data documentation and metadata, metadata standards, uh, uh, and, and so on, and some technical know-how. This is uh, from my experience. Uh, I recommend you read if you want to know more about this. Uh, about this, this is uh, not a new new article, but very good one. Easy to read one, uh, and it's uh, if you uh, want to know more about uh, institutional repositories and what is needed. Uh, on the next slide, I have uh, this picture is from that article uh, where uh, they compare uh, an article about skills needed on, on a, a domain-specific data repository. 
and institutional data registry. These are the findings of, of Leon Stivlia. Uh, and uh, they also have this similar kind of experience or uh, results that we have that you need to have uh, uh, some kind of stubbornness to understand the complexity and diversity, then metadata skills in the personal skills on com communication and collaboration, and then technical skills uh, on library architecture analysis, repositories, and so on. And that's it all from me. Thank you. Thank you.